Fireworks are going on Round the mystery of your life I know more than I can say For I like the names and places To reveal how you came to be Where you are now Can something as small and playful as a music box Inspire an artist to go on a musical journey of wonder and enchantment? Yes, there is such a place where one can find these things and more. Tucked away in the mountains, far removed from the urban craziness, she waits in quiet anticipation. Once a year, musicians from all over Canada and beyond join together to breathe creative life into the fanciful little town of Wells, British Columbia. I am Carmen Muccelli. Let's go there. Let's go to the festival that is all things art. Let's go to Wells. Welcome to Wells! <laughs> A small town like Wells has such a big festival. There's kind of a history in Wells for arts and culture. It dates back to the 1930s when the town was first established. Fred Wells was a, a gold prospector in the area and he found gold up in the mountain behind us. And uh, he had a policy of hiring uh, miners who had, who could play an instrument or who were dancers, who were artists. He really wanted to have a lot of arts and culture here. So I guess the festival kind of started with that inspiration in mind. Organizers and artists point out that what sets Arts Wells apart from a lot of other festivals is the feeling of inclusiveness and community spirit. Julie Fowler, one of the creative forces behind Arts Wells, gives insight into the workings of a celebration of all things art. When I first came up here, I just was like, this, is a, this would be a great spot to have a festival. Um, and it seems to be kind of what I what I'm drawn to do is just gathering up artists and, and celebrating their talents. Who were the drivers in this whole process other than you? Uh, Yael Wand, who is also a musician who is performing at the festival, and, um, and then uh, Ruthie Tabata, uh, and we went to school together in, in Montreal, so we... Um, and Christina Zanker who's also a musician and cello player. And, uh, and then Paul Crawford, um, he sort of joined forces with us. He uh, started the One Minute Play Festival. So that was a separate event previously. And then the first year of the festival, we joined those things together. So it's kind of a neat uh, collaboration in that way. The music um, is, I think for the most part, the main draw because festivals, you know, are, tend to, to be about the music because people want to dance, they love, you know, it's sort of the, it brings people in. Um, but then to add the other elements, um, I think just help to, to create mm -hmm. the bigger picture and, and show that it's all part of the same thing. Everyone is, is on the same level, whether you're a volunteer uh, or a performer, mm -hmm. um, you kind of have the same privileges. And I think uh, that's probably what attracts people to it as well. Um, just getting the opportunity to, to be part of, of everything going on and, uh, yeah. Jarimba got the main hall jumping by their performance that included energetic dancing. During our visit with Jarimba, Coco demonstrated some African style steps for us. Can 
you introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm Robin. I'm the marimba player and leader of the band. And? Yeah, my name is Kukasali Jubat. I'm from West Africa. Now I live in Vancouver. And who is Jarimba? Jarimba is a six-piece uh, Afro-funk ensemble based out of Vancouver. Um, we have drums, we have bass, guitar, Koka is playing djembe, we have also congas. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys that we actually went to music school together and the uh, band just grew out of there. And what kind of music does Jarimba play? How would you describe your music? It's a mixture. We've got the African influences from Coca. Yeah. Yeah. You want to share a little bit of your tradition? We have a... Uh, Where are you from, Coca? I'm from Guinea, West Africa. Yes. I'm from Mandinko tribe. And if you hear Mandinko tribe, like my family is Griot family. And Griot family, if you hear Griot family, like somebody play music, all family, like, like 400 years ago. In Your story, family has my been family. Playing music for 400 years. Yeah, long time. Wow. So yeah. it's a tradition in your yes, family. Yes, it's black culture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's lying. Yeah. And uh, music we play is almost like a world music. World music. Yeah. yeah. So world a music. mix of different uh, yeah, mix traditions of. and genres. Yeah. Too? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So do you have other cultural? Um, ethnic influences in your group. You're from Africa, you're I'm, a native I'm Canadian. I'm native Canadian, here, Canadian. Yes. yeah. The rest of the guys are actually all born in BC. Yeah. We have different heritage backgrounds, yeah. but um, I've, I've studied a lot of Afro-Cuban music and the dance and been to Cuba, so we have a little bit of that influence in the music as well, for sure. Yeah, and you yeah. said you play the marimba, and that, yes. to me, it looked like a xylophone. Can you tell <laughs> us the difference? Yeah, well, it's in the same family. Um, the only difference with the marimba is Often it's a little bit bigger, and the way that the resonators, you know, the, did you see the pipes underneath? I did, I yeah. Did, yes. So those are, they create an, a warmer sound. Mm -hmm. The xylophone tends to cut more, right? Like in orchestral playing, it cuts sharp over the whole orchestra, right? But the marimba, you have a warmer, nicer tone, right? So it blends better with the African yeah, Caribbean. Yeah, it comes yes. more from Africa. Yeah. 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 What is African dancing exactly? You want to show something? Show me something. Okay, yeah. African dance. This is one. See? This is African dance? Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Whoa, you that see? looks cool. <laughs> Go, Coca. That's yeah. <laughs> cool. Kevin Kane gave us insight into life in the fast lane during his days with the popular Canadian band, The Grapes of Wrath. Kevin has a special place in his heart for Wells and finds inspiration in sharing ideas and creativity with other artists. Can you tell us how your involvement with Arts Well started here? Uh, well, it came through Paul Crawford, who is one of the organizers. I believe you have talked to him already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he had approached me just over three years ago about 
doing a performance down in Grand Forks. He was running the art gallery there. And he also mentioned Art Wells and was telling me about it. And um, he'd emailed me prior to that about coming up to Wells, but Arts Wells was kind of a new festival at the time. So oddly enough at the time that he'd approached me about it, I'd sort of given up on, on playing music, at least performing it or whatever. I just thought, whatever, you know, the way the, the record industry is going, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but I thought, okay, well, what the heck, I'll, I'll do this thing in Grand Forks. And then that ended up getting canceled. So I came up to Wells anyway, and um, it, it, it just, it was a really important time for me. It changed a lot of how I look at um, the role of music in people's lives and, and in my life and what I'm doing and, and all of that stuff. And also some really strange things kind of fell in place while I was up here. through different people I met here. I met Christina Zanker, who ended up playing cello on my album and singing all the background vocals, and uh, met uh, through a, a woman up here, uh, Lisa Pashinsky. Uh, she, she brought a guy over to my house one night, an uh, upright bass player named Stefan Bienz, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I ended up doing another record, uh, which is what I'm out kind of supporting now. Mm -hmm. Although I don't, I don't look at it the same way anymore. You know, it, it's not like the whole, the whole record industry treadmill of, of, you know, release an album, go out and tour, you know, make lots of money for the record company, then go home pretty much broke and then release another record, you know, that mm -hmm, whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, It changed it's, your uh, life on different levels, it, it it's not just musically. Life, yeah. yeah, and, and uh, you know, the, the way that art swells is, uh, you, you just kind of have to roll with things, you know, mm -hmm. you, you just, things happen mm -hmm. here. vibrant and creative. Yeah, and everybody pulls together and, you know, for a town of the size that uh, Wells is, they, they've got, you know, thanks to a few people, mm -hmm. but the support of everyone, they've got a really amazing little festival here that's, you know, the vibe is great and the music is really great and um, if there's a problem, people fix it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no problem is so big that it can't be fixed. And you come here and there's absolutely no egos. You know, I, I, with Grapes, we'd done other festivals and there's this whole pecking order and, you know, who gets this dressing room and all that sort of crap. And it just doesn't take place mm -hmm. in, in Wells. Um, everybody's here, uh, you know, regardless of how many records you may have sold or where you've played or what you've done, uh, everybody's kind of on the same level. From Wells, I've kind of learned to just go with the flow, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, keep doing what I'm doing um, and, and, and be positive about it, enjoy the moment and opportunities and whatnot will come up. Not all performances were a combination of music and singing. Others were of the spoken word, as demonstrated to us by Shane Koizan and his original composition, Frozen in Frobisher Bay. Long will this winter be Frozen in Frobisher Bay Frozen in Frobisher Bay I dreamt once that even though we're not related, and even though I'm a boy and you're a girl, I dreamt once that we were Siamese twins. We spent most of our days brushing each other's hair and playing Scrabble. It was lovely. 
And then one day a doctor told us he could change our lives forever, filled our heads with ideas like privacy. So we said yes, because we considered ourselves adventurous types. So they rolled us into the operating room and put us under. And then I had a dream within a dream. I dreamt that I was running swiftly and with a grace I have never known, ducking and rolling to avoid sharp branches. I took lessons from Jesus Christ lizards and learned to step lightly upon water, then ran across oceans, stopping to catch my breath from backs of whales that came up for air. I ran so fast and so far, I felt like a lawman trying to capture the escaped convict of my own breath. Later I woke and discovered that we'd been placed on opposite ends of the recovery room. You were sitting up in your bed crying, so I asked you, what's wrong? And you asked me, why did you run away? So I limped towards you, climbed inside your bed, ran my hand through your hair and told you I didn't. I was running to find you. Hawaiian influence is at the core of the music by Blue Island Trio. Tim, can you tell us about your band? What Absolutely. is it all about? Sure. Um, well, the Blue Island Trio started out as a, sort of a Hawaiian project. Yeah, you were you formed for luau, right? That's right. The it, the trio came together as a result of a, of a luau party that was happening in in Vancouver, and they needed some Hawaiian music, and. Uh, I play Hawaiian music, it's sort of my, um, one of my real big uh, loves and so we, um, I, I threw the trio together and we played the luau, they had the roast pig and everything like that and the rest is history. I really uh, enjoy bluegrass music, blues music, uh, jazz, fusion, um, all of those things and uh, all of those, all of those styles of music, found their way into my uh, my compositions. So, the result is something that's kind of different. That's the one most wonderful thing about music is that it makes its way all around the the world in in that uh, in that way. There was only about. Um, 15 or 20 years that elapsed between um, the steel guitar being a part of Hawaiian music mm -hmm. uh, before it became a part of um, American country music. But I like to explore the sort of the space in between as well. I've gotten really into uh, composing music for, for that instrument and so I think the, the next thing that we'll see is a number of uh, compositions for, uh, for pedal steel guitar and um, I'd like to release an album of, uh, of pedal steel guitar music with this trio. Each year, Arts Wells has been adding new venues to the festival. This year, the old church provided an intimate setting and rich acoustics as proven to us by a special performance by the Gruff. Just explain to us what, what kind of music you play. 
Uh, we do kind of like roots country music. It's based on lots of folk traditions, but we put our own flavor in it, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's um, a more modern twist, or is it more... Uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. We used to be called Billy Goats Gruff, and um, people started to think we were children's entertainers, or children ourselves. So um, we thought we'd like to change the name. And, um, and one day uh, we were at this Chinese restaurant and we were having dinner and we opened the fortune cookie and all it said was gruff. <laughs> We didn't start playing together until after school was out. We were like, mm -hmm. I think about 20 and, and uh, got things going then and picked up Terry about three and a half years ago and Adam came along about two years ago and you just voila. Yeah, you had to balance the estrogen in the band? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what, what instruments do you guys play? You, you I play guitar. Guitar and I play band? drums. Yeah? I play bass. I'm the fiddle player. And you all sing? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So not, 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 not Adam yet. Yeah. Not Adam yet. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> We're working on him. <laughs> Have to get your harmonies going, eh? <laughs> totally. We need the low voice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. How is the Wales Festival different, or what does set it apart for you? The size of it and the kind of people mm. that come to it, it it's just so so friendly and compact and everyone is there. Mm -hmm. Like in a, f a normal festival you go to and it's in a park in a city and mm -hmm. everybody at the park is happy. Mm -hmm. But here it's the whole town, and yeah. it, which is cool. Like it's very here, inclusive. You're here and, and yeah. it's just, yeah, it's just really neat and it has a really good feeling. Reduce that I play, yeah. and I have d different guitars. I've got a Weizenborn guitar, which is a Hawaiian guitar. I've got a regular six string guitar, and I've got a Kona, which is another kind of Hawaiian guitar. I've got a kick pedal, an electronic kick drum, and djembe drums, and a drum kit. And, and you're I, doing this all at the same time, right? Kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the only thing I can't quite do is sing and play the didgeridoo at the same time. Although I sing through the didgeridoo sometimes. Yeah, I heard you so, do all these things at the same time. Kind of, yeah. yeah. It's just a mishmash yeah. of stuff. And so uh, never our two performances the same. Mm -hmm. They're always, they're always qu quite different. So. It sounds like a really wild, crazy, versatile stage show. And how, what's the inspiration behind that? How did you oh. get to that point? <laughs> accident you know it was a I've been a banging on legs and kitchen tables all my life and so I was always kind of a drummer and mm -hmm. then I got into playing guitar um, my grade six teacher was a big inspiration he got me playing guitar yeah and then uh, high school band drum kit and been writing songs ever since. I, I, I learned guitar by uh, learning the Neil Young Harvest book. I, yeah. From front to back I learned every song and I could, back then when I was a kid I could sing as high as Neil Young. And, and off key as Neil Young? Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> but not with the same style. Like he yeah. had a certain I know, class, I know, you know he's great. I love Neil Young. Me too. No disrespect no, to Neil Young. Neil Young is amazing yeah. and you know, I, but, but eventually I just decided I'm not going to be doing covers anymore. I just want to write my own songs yeah. because covers, I mean covers are great, you know, mm -hmm. but writing is, is a whole different uh, element. It adds a whole different thing to it. And, and 
now that I'm writing with the use of didgeridoos and kick drums and, and, and all that stuff, you know, it makes the writing so much more interesting. Being a one-man band, it, it, in certain ways it's harder, right? It's harder because I have to coordinate things. But when you're playing in a band, you have to also coordinate things. You have to be able to, uh, you know, like look over the bass player and the yeah, drummer and, yeah, you know, get your yeah. timing right. And you have to play the song the same way. I, I can never play a song the same way mm -hmm. twice. Like if I sat to here and played two songs, like this song twice in a row, it wouldn't come out the same. Yeah. And so to be expected to do that every night, I think I would get bored with it. Mm -hmm. But this way, if I'm doing the drums, like I can change it up. Or if I make a mistake, I can sure make it look like it was meant to happen. Totally. So there's no yeah. train wrecks ever, right? Because yeah. it's like, okay, I'll just stop now. Yeah, I just meant to do it that way. Yeah, right? no, no, it's yeah. supposed to go yeah. like that. That bad note, there wasn't really a bad note. No. It was just the way it is. Yeah. I guess all my music is inspired from where I live. You know, I live yeah. I live on Vancouver Island, and I live. My house is overlooking the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. and there's wilderness all around me. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to write songs about that all the time. And I'm, you know, there's a a, a little bit of an environmental edge to all my songs mm -hmm. too, because I really care about the world we live in, and that's kind of my way of of doing my, you know, contributing yeah. to the world, trying to change the world in in a small way, you know song at a time, I guess. So that that's what inspires me. Yeah. found his sound in the didgeridoo, globe-trotting songstress Muntara found her inspiration in Australia. Can you tell me where that name comes from? It's pretty unique. Green Tara. Well, Green Tara is actually a goddess, and I was goddess given of yeah, what? a goddess. Um, well, a goddess. What some say the goddess of compassion, um, one of the most favored of all the Taras. And uh, I was given that name when I was touring in Australia about seven years ago because I was doing a. Uh, uh, a showcase night there mm -hmm. at the Arts Factory in Byron Bay, if anyone's been there. And uh, and I said, there's so many Taras here, how am I going to differentiate myself from everyone else? And my friend who was a Buddhist and a dancer, an ab Aboriginal man from Australia, did traditional dancing, uh, Waza was his name, he said, um, how about Green Tara? She's my favorite goddess. And I was like, that's great! So, it stuck. How would you describe <laughs> your music? Um, what kind of genre? Soul, funk, reggae. Um, you know, it's really um, it's really influenced by all types of um, 
music. So, you know, I started, when I started, I played in like a southern blues rock band down in Florida. And, uh, you know, we played like Pan and you know, like I grew up on Trinidadian music and old soul and funk and um, just everything I love is sort of mixed in there. So it sounds, like, you, it sounds like you've had a lot of fun with this and you've yeah. seen many parts of the world just through music, just by yeah. taking that step when you were really young and, and, and starting to tour, taking your guitar and getting out there. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I see, um, like I see young musicians now, like in, in their teens and, and stuff, and, you know, I mean, that's the time to pick up your guitar and go places. I mean, if I hadn't taken my guitar to Australia that time, uh, I don't know if I'd be where I am now because I realized, I mean, I had my first paid gig in, in uh, Australia. It was paid for beer, actually. <laughs> but you got to start somewhere. And, um, you know, it just, it just kept going. And I had so much positive reinforcement on the road when I was meeting people. And I actually was sitting on a beach in New Zealand about a month after I had played at a party Party, a friend's party and um, and I walked by this woman who was singing one of my songs and I was oh, like hey man, I know that exciting. song and she's like hey you're the girl from the party and at that point I was like okay I, I gotta keep doing this <laughs> Paul Crawford, the mastermind behind the International One Minute Play Festival, shares his vision for the future of Arts Wells. I was wondering, what is a One Minute Play Festival? Well, it was an idea that a friend of mine, Charles Ross, and I came up with nine years ago, and it was to create a, an event that was all-inclusive that anybody could participate in that wasn't a lot of pressure or stress, and so we figured everyone could do something in 60 seconds, and so we came up with a 60-second performance festival, and, and that started off with that, and you know, it's sort of grown since then, but we realized that a lot of people didn't feel they could, you know, the word play sort of gave a lot of ideas to people, so they couldn't, you know, they didn't want to write a play or didn't feel they could write a play, mm -hmm. so then we added a new category of women and excuses, and so now there's no excuses to not enter the play, and it's grown over the years, and we've got entries from around the world and from noted celebrities such as Arthur Hiller, who was um, a Canadian director in Hollywood who won an Academy Award a number of years ago, cartoonists like Jim Sherman, who wrote the Sherman's Lagoon cartoon mm -hmm. strip, and various other people, so it's really sort of captured the imagination of a lot of people, so it's been really a fun kind of a thing. Every year I'm just amazed that it does still have the level of interest that it has been because I know nothing about theatre myself, I'm not an artist mm -hmm. and it's just something we did as a lark and just to see it grow and develop really is, is fantastic and I think it sort of heralds back to that idea of you know being at summer camp and mm -hmm. doing the skit night and things like that and I think it, in that regard it's great, it's playful, it's fun and you know I think people really enjoy it so it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's really heartening for me to see that it does grow and yeah. expand every year and, and people really seem to be a highlight for them to come out there every weekend and see it so that's exciting. The original dream of the concept was to be able to have it spread across the province and have other people in other communities run their own one minute play festivals and then maybe have Wells be like the sort of the one minute playoff. Everybody would send their their winners up here to Wells and we would sort of have a one minute showdown. It's all about collaboration and working together and building a larger community. It's not about one place but really working in collaboration with other places and if we can do that here in Wells and be a catalyst for growth and, and development and economic uh, well-being of other communities around the province and that would be great and certainly within the region we'd love to really work with other communities such as Horsefly and likely in various other mm -hmm. places to help build stuff there and, and yeah. just create a healthier more vibrant region. I think I see my father McRae's musical journey has included being a member of Spirit of the West for many years. She now resides in Nashville and just has recently embraced the banjo as a new tool in her songwriting.
<laughs> so how would you describe the music, your music? Uh, it's really evolved over the years. It's changed a lot. I was I was really into rock, mm -hmm. like harder rock. Yeah. And then I got into a four-piece band. Uh, we were called Terminal City, and we did pretty kind of jangly rock, sort of mm -hmm. um, birds, a la birds, kind of Graham Parsons, that kind of stuff. And then um, I was in a Celtic rock band, Spirit of the West, for many, many years. And, um, and you did quite a lot of touring with them? We did a lot of touring uh, mm -hmm. all over the world. And then when I left them in 98, uh, it was, I started doing my own material. And in the last four years, um, I've added the banjo, which has really changed my songwriting. It's kind of evolved into, you know, from a heavier rock thing, folk-based rock thing, to... Um, a more old-time mm -hmm, feel, mm -hmm. country, mm -hmm. uh, with, but still with a bit of an edge, hopefully. And um, but yeah, it's kind of evolved more into the folk, old-time mm -hmm. sound with the uh, with the banjo, I think. coming to the Wells Festival and performing for many years now. Can you tell us what makes this festival different from all the others that um, you've been to? I think part of it is just the environment and uh, and the organizers of this festival. It um, has, a, has a wonderful um, base in the arts, in painting and visual arts and creative arts, writing. There's a school here, the IMA. Um, does a, a program all summer long with courses and uh, it's just amazing. The sense of community here is wonderful and the history is so important to, to British Columbia. It's very vibrant here, isn't it? Really it really is. And, and friendly. It is. Friendly. And it's, it's still small, mm -hmm. which um, is really a nice thing. You know, it has, it has a different sense of, than some of the really large festivals does. Uh, and, and I kind of hope it stays mm -hmm. that way. There's just something really charming about mm -hmm. it, and it's, just, it's wonderful being here. This is my fourth, mm -hmm. fourth year in a row, so I love it. It's, it's really great, and the, it, I think the people make, make a difference yeah, in the surroundings, true. you know. Some people collect stamps, some people collect coins, but our Miss Emily Brown collects music boxes. It's not surprising when you swoop in from behind And I never saw your face, I only heard your calling You're such a wicked bird and I found your worn out trails Slick with all the shells of soft and gentle creatures 
pictures and this is a child. And why the miss? What's about, what's, what's that all about? Miss Emily Brown. I don't think it was really my idea. It just sort of happened. I don't know. I think it, so? I think it showed up on a poster yeah. that somebody made and um, it just kind of stuck. It's kind of like a storybook character. Well, it's you catchy. Know, it's, it's, it, is yeah, catchy. Yeah, it is catchy. It's I smart to happened. stick with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Miss Emily Brown, what kind of music do you play? I'm doing, I guess, like a folk, it's mostly like a folk pop kind of a sound, but I have a lot of jazz influence mm -hmm. as well, so some of the tunes are a little more jazzy. World driver, there is nowhere I've been. I've seen brothers and sisters, and kites in the wind. I have seen buttons on strings. Would have you told me that this is your second mm -hmm. year playing here. And what yes. you said, this is such a vibrant festival. So many um, musicians meet, and you said you made a really good connection last year here. Yeah, can I you tell really us about that? Yeah. yeah? Um, so yeah, last year was my first year, and I actually, I had only played at one other festival mm -hmm. ever before, so I was really excited. And I ended up meeting a good friend, Corwin Fox, yeah. and we have formed a duo project um, called More Love. More Love. More Love. Mm -hmm. And we have just learned that we've received a grant to do an album. Oh, that's exciting. So we're going to do that, that this must winter. Be, you must be yeah. just... So this is yeah. a great, amazing yeah. festival for... It's so yeah, vibrant on artists. all different levels, right? All the artists coming together and, mm -hmm. and playing. You got gold farms and bags of gold coins in your mind And if that's the way you look at love Love will be hard to find if love was honey So I'm going to be working on a project, actually it involves music boxes mm -hmm. It's based on um, my grandmother's diary from World War II mm -hmm. She was a typist mm. in London and she wrote this amazing journal talking wow, about you're going every to... day of her, what she was doing each day. And I'm going to delve into that and research wow. her life and yeah. write songs around that. Get inspired by that yeah. and have that real connection with your grandmother. That's mm -hmm. so neat. Mm -hmm. Well, good for you. It sounds like you're on to a lot of interesting endeavors. With a mouthful of bees Working all night for free Corvin Fox has been a constant performer over the past few years. His many talents lead him to collaborate with other artists and embark on adventurous journeys into musical manifestations. Corvin, you've been here many times before. I have, yeah. And what's your impression this year? Oh, this is the best year yet. Every year gets progressively better. Why so? Uh, why does it get better mm -hmm, every year? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it gets better every year because 
Paul and Julie primarily have a real strong vision for how things should improve and every year they're taking new steps. So there's a new stage every year practically. This year it's the, uh, the old church. Yeah, we noticed there's uh, lots of new venues going on. Yeah, right? every yeah. year there's an, yeah. been a new stage and so this year that old church is just a really incredible acoustic environment and it's it's just beautiful acoustically and the vibe is incredible in there. Have you been recording lately at all? I have, yeah. I recorded uh, recently Raghu Lokanathan's mm -hmm. e new EP and I'll be producing his album in the fall. So we'll be working together and we've been touring a little bit. I recorded Miss Emily Brown's new album. And um, you're producing for a lot of different artists in, in British Phillip. Columbia, right? Yeah. And then there's also in Serenoni Metzner. Yeah, I, I produced her last yeah. album, which she won a couple of awards for. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exciting. So you're involved on different levels with artists. You're a performer, yeah. you collaborate with them, right. and then you also produce them. Yeah, mm -hmm. producing is something you write I'm falling with other in love artists with. Too? I co-wrote some of the songs mm -hmm. on Sarah Noni Metzner's album, mm -hmm. the Little Bird one. And yeah, yeah. We, we co-wrote a bunch of those songs. Yeah. And uh, with Miss Emily Brown, we're co-writing a bunch for the More Love Project. And uh, yeah, I like collaborating with people in various ways. Mm -hmm. Like everybody brings different elements to the to a, a project. You're a full blood musician. You do. That's true. You're all over the place. You do all these different things, and you yeah. get inspiration from collaboration with other artists. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. collaborating is one of my favorite things. Yeah. One of the particular features of this festival I find is that uh, from year to year, many of the performers are the same, um, and. Uh, I really like that because it really gives you the chance to get to know other performers. Because at any particular festival, uh, I, you kind of have limited attention, you know, like how much you can see, uh, how much you can kind of really attend to, because it can be quite draining when you're also trying to just get ready to play yourself. But I, I find um, the same performers coming back year after year kind of gives me opportunities to get to know them as people and also uh, opportunities to, s to see one artist who I might have missed a, a previous year and also um, kind of see them in different contexts you know in the context of their their formal performance but uh, also maybe just sitting around uh, playing somewhere which is also one of the best parts you know kind of informal jams that happen and there there have been some really great ones that have happened here One of the showstoppers of the weekend was definitely fingerstyle guitar champion Don Alder. Don shared with us the advice he was given by his lifelong best friend, the man in motion himself, Rick Hansen. Your friend Rick Hansen, and and he is um, heading the Man in Motion tour, or he's been heading that tour for everybody who doesn't know that, yeah. has been a big inspiration in your musical career, right? And his attitude, you know, that whatever you set out to do, you can do it, and not let fear stop you, has made a major he difference was, in your life. Oh, amazing mentor! Not not just to me. I mean, I, like I, like I said, I I think I'm a slow learner because I've been around him so long that. I should have been doing things a long time ago, just too rebellious. Mm -hmm. But I've seen him change so many people's lives by being out in the road. And even being back home, you know, the accomplishments he's done since we've been back home are phenomenal. You know, we have an International Spinal Cord Research Center coming into place uh, maybe two, end of 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rick spearheaded that, and uh, we have our annuals, Wheels of Motion, and uh, also the Fraser River Surgeon Constellation Society. Rick's got that going. So yeah, he's mm -hmm. a guy, nonstop guy, and I still work with him. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, one of the great things for me is that uh, he recently became a big believer in that that music. You can spread some good message, yeah. and and touch people's lives, and maybe change their lives of some, some sort. And so I think the foundation will maybe uh, build into my job the ability to go out and maybe you know, share some of that. So stuff a little bit. Tell me about 
about how how you develop this particular style of guitar playing? Sure. Well, <clears throat> I've been playing, um, I've been gotten back into acoustic about the last 10 years, but before that I had dropped playing for such a, like a very long time. Um, I grew up in Williams Lake, so Williams Lake boy. Rick and I grew up together, we you know, did school together. I was on the fishing trip with him that had the accident, I got thrown clear and he walked away, or I walked away and he was paralyzed of course. But uh, so he went to, on to become an athlete and I went down the track of becoming a musician. And every six months, Rick would, Rick would always loyally call me and tell me what was going on, and we catch up. And uh, so I'm in Vancouver, I'm at the session, and I hear that he's in the hospital. And uh, so definitely I, I went down to the hospital to, to say hi and chat with him. And I get in there, and of course they got him in hospital morphine, so he's got this big smile on, on his face, so he doesn't feel too much pain and stuff. And he's not talking very, he's a little bit incoherent, right? But we're having a great conversation, and then I, I'm just getting ready to leave. And, and he said, hey, Donnie. And I said, yeah. He said, hey, I got this great idea. And I said, yeah, like the fishing trip? <laughs> and he uh, said, no, 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 no. I, I want to go around the world in a wheelchair. I want to create awareness for people with disabilities and uh, by removing barriers so they can reach their full potential. Mm -hmm. right? And I went, wow, that's a pretty ambitious thing. And so I didn't think too much of it, but I just remember kind of having a smile on my face. And I walked towards the door, from the, the, the hospital room door, and there was a nurse standing there. And I said uh, to the nurse, I said, is that guy back there? And she said, yeah, yeah. I said, you have a straight jacket program, you might want to enroll him, right? And so we both looked back to the mirror, we were sitting on the bed. Little did you know, right? With that big yeah. smile on his face. And um, so, yeah, but six months later, I, I get this phone call from him, and he's serious. He wants to go do it. And it was a lot for me, because I, you know, my career was going not too bad, so I had to put career on hold. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you get to know Rick, you know, he was very helped me, even when we were young, just trying to get me to believe in myself, because I had a real problem with that. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he just came after me and said, I'm doing this tour, you're going to join me? I said, okay, let's do it. And uh, in 1985, we blasted off on the, on the Man of Motion tour. And this is a long answer to your question about how I got doing this kind of guitar, but um, after the tour, when I got back, there was a big void in my life. I didn't, didn't know what to do, where to go. And, but there was a guitar sitting there. Uh, and actually, that guitar I got, had was given to me by uh, uh, the, um, uh, George Cohen from McDonald's when we were on the tour coming back. And uh, I told him I would use that gift to be creative to help people. So I started playing guitar again, and, and all of a sudden my percussive drumming stuff that I learned started working its way into the guitar picking. So first I was starting to pick and actually hit down yeah. the guitar. Next thing combining I was doing both instruments that, anyway. combining both instruments and finding snare drums yeah. downs, and to the point where I actually uh, started developing this style. And then the over the top came playing. Playing sort of started by seeing some other guys do it and mm -hmm. just then making it my own kind of thing. After the tour, like I said, there was a void and I was mm -hmm. playing music and getting back into acoustic but nowhere really to channel what I was creating. Um, and Rick being the consummate athlete, his mind is always in competition mode, right? And so I remember I was on a fishing trip with him and uh, he said, so Donnie, what are you gonna do about this guitar music? Where, where do you wanna go with it? And I was like, well, I wanna play for people. Yeah. Well, don't you wanna do something more with it? And I'm going like, what? He said, well, aren't there any competitions you can go into? And I said, well, yeah, there is, but, you know, and then I made up 101 excuses why I, I couldn't do the competition. Sure. Musicians usually are not super competitive on that level, right? Absolutely. It's, I was very, very, it's a very sensitive... Yeah, and especially for me, because that's, I just love to make noise, yeah. right? And, but um, he challenged me again, you know, and it's funny, because, um, as I told you a while back, um, you know, I, I go out and I do, I help Rick with his presentations, mm -hmm. and, and many times in his presentations, he has this saying that he tells the audience, something I heard, I've heard about a thousand times, but it never resonated with me. So in the fishing boat, when we were out there fishing, yeah. he said this to me personally, and I was like, oh, not this again. But that day, the penny dropped for me. I, I listened to what he said, and I went, wow, this really means something. And he's saying it directly to me. And it's pretty simple. He said, people, a lot of times, won't pursue their dreams because of fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And that failure really is just not having the courage to try. And so when he said it that way, it's like, Hmm, that means I just have to kind of practice, doesn't it? And go out there and put it out there. And so I did. I, you know, I went to this big competition. Um, and back then it was called the National Fingerstyle Championships in Kansas. Been running for 30 years. 
and uh, Don Ross was the only Canadian to ever win it twice, and then Bob Evans won it in 2003. Mm -hmm. So only two Canadians have won it. And then it changed into the international finger style competition because we were getting so many international uh, competitors coming through it. And uh, so in 2006, I went back and got second place. And in 2007, I, I walked away as the first Canadian to bring the title home. So pretty happy about that. And the way it works Congratulations. Is, thank, thank this you. This is definitely worth This is very great. Very no, it's special for wonderful. you after oh, all this practicing. Yes. Singer-songwriter Yael Wan told us that she started writing a song the day she moved from Wales to Smithers, British Columbia. A year later, she realized that Wales was calling her home. Upon her return, she finished the song and titled it, She Calls My Name. The song speaks of her love to this little mountain town. called a songwriter of uncommon skill and one of the freshest new voices in Canadian folk music. How does that make you feel, Yael, when you hear these critics? Um, oh, it, I don't take it too seriously, really. I mean, it's it's nice and it's it's great to always get complimented on my songwriting and on my performances, but just keep on doing what I do and try to enjoy myself. How would you describe your music? Um, uh, wow, that's a really good question. I'm, I always have a hard time uh, classifying it. Um, I think it's very folky. It's got a lot of elements of folk, but it's got a really modern approach to at least my content and to some of the songs. And I try to, I'm a bit of a sponge. I take from wherever I, whatever I hear and I try to include it in my music. your inspiration to start with songwriting in the first place? I didn't have an inspiration, it was just it was always something I did. I you was always, always yeah, singing yeah. and I was always making stuff up and you know I went through that phase in high school that everybody does where you're just writing poetry and I was always singing as well so eventually I decided I have to learn to play an instrument so I could put all these things together and I taught myself to play the guitar and I started writing songs immediately.
I think I like to write about people and about relationships and mm -hmm. people's relationships to you know to one another or mm -hmm. to the place where they are. Mm -hmm. I do take a lot of inspiration from my own life, but I always try to keep it broader and and have my content you know or, or the songs speak out to more mm -hmm. people and just me. This I, get, I don't know. I mean, there's. There, I, I have a lot of writing to do. I'm really mm -hmm. inspired right now to be writing and playing. I'm learning to yeah. play the accordion, which is great oh, as a guitar player and yeah. as a songwriter to do something new. Yeah. So, and right now I've got a harp in my room. I'm I'm playing too. Just just do something a little different. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to explore, you know, writing and explore the instruments, and uh, you know, that's on a creative level. I think. Um, I think coming up next I'll probably work on another album hopefully this mm -hmm. next year and maybe do a little bit more touring and just see what's hap what happens. I really want to enjoy myself as I'm doing this. That's kind of mm -hmm. the goal. Well, sounds great. Sounds like you're up to new ventures and again, well done. Festival well done. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, yeah, Alwan.
here in Wales at the Arts Wales Festival. <laughs> yep. Wait, my straps are showing. Can't have that on TV. No okay. continuity. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you really gave me a rise here. Yeah. Okay. Anyways. Three, two. We're here with Corvin Fox today in front of the uh, museum in Wales. <laughs> what was that? I like guess that was. I don't know. She totally blew it. <laughs> just keep rolling. Try it again. I know it was. I don't know. <laughs> That's just you're a prank, Oh, I'm you're bad. really bad. Yeah, I know. Okay. Is there a back there or something? Like the other hand? Yep. Yeah, I did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just that here in Wales at the community hall last night. <laughs> I'm here in front of the Arts Wales community. No, not Arts Wales. Let me let me think for a second. Okay. Yeah, unless I screw up when I've screwed up many times already. Ba ba ba. No. I'll do that again. Yeah. Huh? Huh? In the headquarters of IMA ever since, and that now it's the headquarters of the festival, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so much for that. Was that bad? I <laughs> guess we can't tell you to say anything bad about Dan right now. Yeah, eh? he's listening. <laughs> Are you listening, Dan? I am. Oh, man. <laughs> When he rendered it, blah, 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 a composition. Yeah, said, oh, God. <laughs> scene, sir, scene 13, take one. 13, two. 13, four. 13, five. 13, five. 13, six. 13, seven. 13, eight. What, what scene is it? Kevin has that 39. 39. In being creative with other artists. Oh, D is in creativity. In the fast lane, during his days with the popular. Oh. Creativity in sharing ideas and. He finds inspiration okay. in sharing okay. with other artists. 13.10. 13.10. Kevin has a special place in his heart for Wells and finds inspiration in sharing ideas and creativity with other artists. Sexless in the country. So we're here today with Yael Wan, the up-and-coming songbird of Hi. Wales. <laughs> and she's going to tell us all about the festival, the inside scoop, the nitty-gritties, the dirty details. Yael! It's dirty. <laughs> How dirty? As dirty as mud, I would say. How dirty is mud? That's it for the That's year. It. The door's shut. The Sunset Theatre will reopen next year. It was so great. Thanks. See you next year's festival. Yeah, see you next year.